We got sewing contractors busted in a Department of Labor investigation, a massive fire at a historic sewing machine factory. We've got a Joanne's update, and we're going to have some K-drama talk. That's all up tonight in Sewing Report Live. Welcome, I'm Jen, your host. If this is your first time here, we go over what is happening in the world of sewing and crafting. So here's how it's going to work. This is kind of a newer format. We are going to cover, cover a number of topics in this show. In between, I will be reading the live chat. So if you're watching this in real time or if you're watching this on the replay, welcome. Welcome to the madness. Uh, we also have a couple ground rules I want to lay out as we get more people here watching this broadcast. Um, the ground rules are if you're participating in the live chat or if you're leaving a comment, uh, I ask that you be respectful to both me and to the other people here. Be civil, be polite, be respectful. The other thing I would like to kindly ask is no politics here. This is a politics-free zone. We can get that many other places, uh, but I've decided this is really not the space to talk about politics. So that's all I ask, but let's get into things. And before we do, I'd like to thank tonight's sponsor, as usual, the Sewing Report Etsy shop, where you can find fabric, sewing supplies, and some handmade goodies. Here, check it out. We have everything from fabric to sewing notions, We've got some bundles. Some of the fabric bundles are on sale if that's something you're interested in. And I I know I took a poll over the past week about some knit fabrics that I have to list. And I've decided after polling you guys, I think what I'm going to do is offer three yard cuts. The general consensus was two or three yards. At least three yards is, you know, enough to make a wide number of projects. And for the people that wanted two yards, it's just an extra yard. So it's be I figure it's better than offering two yards and then the people that want three yards don't have something. So that's probably what I'm going to be doing at this point. But welcome everyone wherever you're watching. I was able to find a few things I wanted to talk about this evening here on a Sunday night. I hope everyone's having a great weekend working on some projects. You know, maybe winding up for the week ahead. But welcome. Let me turn off this music real quick. But yeah, I've been, guys, yeah, we've been doing some research. I got some things I want to talk about. And then I have also been getting back into the K-dramas. So I, I did want to talk a little bit about that towards the end. Okay, so the first story I wanted to talk about. I thought this was very interesting. And I learned some things by researching uh, this particular story. Let me pull this up here. And I've got a few articles and then some resources from the actual Department of Labor. And this is something that I just, I thought was super interesting to me. Uh, so there was a, f a federal investigation involving the Department of Labor. And they were looking into a number of sewing contractors here in the United States. And they found that a number of them were violating the overtime laws. So... If you're not from here, or maybe you know, maybe you're just not in the loop. Um, if you are an hourly employee at a company or for a any type of business, and you work over 40 hours a week, you are supposed to get time and a half. So if you work uh, 50 hours, the last 10 hours, say you make um, like $20 an hour, the last 10 hours of that 50 hours, you're supposed to be getting paid. $30 an hour instead of uh, $20. I believe, yeah, to time and a half. I believe that's about right. So let's check this out. This is from, and by the way, everything I'm, I'm talking about is linked in the description box if you want to check it out on your own. This is from the media outlet, outlet laist.com. Uh, feds recover $1.1 million for garment workers after sewing contractors allegedly withheld overtime pay. Ugh, yikes. Federal regulators announced that $1.1 million in back wages and damages were recovered for 165 garment workers in Los Angeles. Uh, the settlement came after regulators reached a settlement with four sewing contractors who allegedly tried to hide that they withheld overtime wages. The settlement is the biggest to date for California garment workers, according to the Department of Labor on Wednesday. The contractors involved included those operated by Raymond Tecum, 
Maricela Romero, and Joseph DeLau. The trio owned Good Cash LLC and its associated entities, Good Cash Inc., Premium Quality Apparel LLC, and Premium Quality Apparel Inc. Now, from what I understand, these sewing contractors are hired by different clothing companies uh, to make clothing for, you know, different labels. Federal investigators allege uh, these people had employees working 52 hours a week but failed to pay overtime wages. They're also accused of forging payroll records and administering fake checks uh, to conceal their illegal pay methods. Uh, LAist contacted the attorney representing the trio via email but did not receive an immediate response. Department of Labor attorney uh, Carrie Panaccione, sorry I'm going to be butchering some of these names, said it was shocking to see the lengths the employers went to to try to avoid getting caught. When we executed the inspection warrant, they actually turned off the power to the facility and told the employees to leave and they all rushed out of the building. During the investigation, the department applied a hot goods hold on clothes made by the contractor's workers for Beyond Yoga. The hold made it illegal to ship goods that violated the Fair Labor Standards Act or child labor laws within a 30-day window. Panaccione said that when Beyond Yoga found out about the violations, the company immediately paid $582,000 and $317 in back wages and an equal amount in damages. It wasn't the first time federal labor regulators encountered a Takum, Ramiro, and Delau. Panaccione said the trio paid back wages after an investigation revealed they violated the Fair Labor Standards Act in 2021. All right, fun times here. Uh, Panaccione said the garment workers are one of the most vulnerable populations of workers. Federal regulators conducted a garment worker survey in L.A. in 2023 and found that 80 percent of workers were being exploited in one way or in some way or another. Uh, Panaccione reminded workers they have the right to report labor violations to state or federal regulators. And we're going to talk about that because we, I've got some resources to share with you. If they contact us, we will do everything we can to protect their confidentiality, she said, and they do have the right under the law, no matter the circumstances, to make complaints to us about whatever situation they're in, and their employer does not have the legal ability to punish them in any way for that. So pretty pretty interesting stuff there, and I think the, yeah, so here's, I, w I saw this story this week, and I was looking into it a little bit more, and I think the thing that I found the most um, cons concerning for me is that I think a lot of us think we're, we're now conditioned to already know, hey, if something's made overseas, the these items may not be made in the most ethical way. And we're kind of already, I think, conditioned to understand that. But I do think there's kind of a false sense of security in purchasing things that with the made in the USA label. We kind of think, hey, you know, if if I'm buying made in the U.S. or made in America, it it almost kind of gives you a clean conscience. You're like, oh, well, everyone's getting paid a, you know, paid fairly. No one's being exploited. The working conditions are much better. And I think stories and situations like what I just shared with you is why that's not always true. And I've been in situations myself where my employer was kind of skirting the rules like that. Let's just say that. I think a lot of companies, not even, not even just narrowed to garment workers or factory workers, but a lot of employers will try to get out of paying you, whether it be overtime pay or like doing the thing where you're, um, you get a, you get like an, like a lunch break, but then you never get to take the lunch break, that sort of thing. That's happened to me a lot. And I do think this is kind of eye-opening that no matter where items are made as far as clothing goes, there could be workers that are being taken advantage of. So I thought that was an interesting article. And I mean, just from personal experience, I will share this with you. I, I'm, I'm a former news producer and I've worked for uh, TV stations and I worked at a network for the last five years of my career. Now, it's very common in the media industry for employees to be exploited like that. It's super, super common. So one example is TV stations, media outlets, newspapers, I'm sure do this too, radio stations. 
uh, they will kind of get around paying you overtime by giving you a salary. So you'll be, sal- you know, and salaried workers are exempt from overtime. But here's the catch with that is that when I was a salaried employee, okay, for real, my salary at the first job I ever had in television, I was a morning show producer and my salary was $20,000 a year. I think that worked out to be like eight, $8 an hour if I was working 40 hours a week. But the thing is, I wasn't working 40 hours a week. I was usually working at least 50 hours a week. And because I was quote unquote salary, the company did not have to pay me overtime, even though I was literally making like $8 an hour. And this was a job that required a college degree. The first job out of college, again, it's supposed to be like your first you know, big girl job or whatever. And I was working way, like in some cases I was working way, well, I think one time I had a shift that was close to 24 hours. Now it was like a natural disaster, but I was not paid anything. Like that's the thing, they, these employers get away with it by, again, giving you a salary and then, but you're expected to be at work for like crazy amount of hours. So that's something that happened to me personally. And Thinking back on it, you're like, why did I, why did I put up with that? And the other thing is they, w- they would do is, so if, if I was getting paid per hour and I was working like 55 hours a week, that's way less than, that's like less than minimum wage. So I was definitely get, getting paid less than minimum wage uh, working as a news producer at a TV station out of college. Um, the other thing is that, that w- they would do is instead, like say you worked, um, Oftentimes, you would have to fill in for other people or work extra. So say I had to work on a Saturday or like on the weekends. Instead, of they wouldn't pay you any overtime. What they would do is my employer would do something called comp days. So if I worked uh, six days in a week, instead of getting any extra money, which honestly, I probably would have preferred the extra money. And this is why I think I do think a lot of jobs, I, I don't, I think maybe the salary thing should be have like you can only salary an employee if they're making a certain amount of money but I'm sorry having an employee salaried at like twenty thousand dollars a year is a joke getting no overtime and having to work way over 40 hours a week so but they would do this thing called comp time so if I say like if I was working oh and I was on the overnight shift too so not only was this like a really crappy job way over 40 hours a week but it was overnight so my shift was technically from 11 p.m to 8 a.m but in order for me to like do everything I would typically have to come in early so I would come in at like 10 or 10 30 and often I wasn't getting out of the building until 9 a.m so I was it was very common for me to work eight 10 hour shifts um, the other but in going back to the comp days too is that so say I worked a Saturday instead of giving me any more money they would allow me to use that day sort of as vacation day another day. So that's how this company I worked for got around paying a lot of people overtime was by doing the comp days and then by having you be on salary, even though the salary is like 20 grand a year. So that's one thing that I experienced personally. And again, I'm not a, I was not a garment worker or a sewing. Um, you know, I didn't work in a sewing factory, but that's one way that my employer uh, definitely exploited a lot of the employees there. And this is very common in the media industry. So, in fact, it's probably very common in many industries, not just not just media. But reading that really kind of, you know, it just made me angry for all of those people, you know. And just that, you know, there is such a thing as, as wage theft, and that's happening to a lot of people everywhere, um, not just overseas. Um, so I think that's one reason why I'm personally glad I can sew my own items is because again you might think hey if something's made in America or it's made in the United States it's cool and clearly it's it's not um so let's take a look at a few other resources all right so this is from the Department of Labor Okay, so this is the official press release from this uh, same story. So I just kind of want to, and it has a lot of the same information as the LAist article. Um, But I thought this was pretty, like, 
I don't know. It's it's interesting. I'm I'm really glad the Department of Labor is putting out um, news releases like this just so we can get all of the information. So again, this is from the official source. A lot of it is the same information as the article. Um, okay, here is a good quote here. Uh, Garment workers are often subject to stringent production requirements and receive some of the lowest wages in the country, uh, said Wage and Hour Administrator Jessica Lumen. The garment industry employment model involves multiple layers of contractors and subcontractors and leaves workers vulnerable to wage theft and exploitation. This case demonstrates that the Wage and Hour Division will hold to account employers across the supply chain to ensure that workers receive the pay they have earned and have and the rights they are afforded to uh, by law. So this is pretty interesting. And you know what? I'm glad they're cracking down on these companies and on these people because this is illegal activity. And again, the, this is this is an example of unethical business practices. So you know, good for the you know. Again, I know it's we rarely ever say this, but good for the feds. Um, so they also cited a good cash, but look at how many they, they were able to get over $1 million in back wages for these people. That's a lot of money for about 165 people. So I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, and just another more tidbits, uh, federal law prohibits retaliation, harassment, intimidation, or adverse actions against employees who assert their workplace rights an employer cannot retaliate, harass, or intimidate workers for exercising their rights or for receiving wages they are owed as a result of the department's investigation. Okay. Employers who steal hard-earned wages from workers who produce their goods may incur penalties that disrupt the operations of their distributors and cause production to fall short of customers' ex expectations, as the enforcement of the hot goods provision in this case shows, explained Solicitor of Labor uh, Seema Nanda. To avoid potential liability, businesses must monitor their supply chains closely uh, to make sure the goods they purchase are made legally. Good information here. A 2022 wage and hour division survey of 50 Southern California garment sewing contractors and manufacturers found violations in 80% of cases, leading to the recovery of more than $892,000 in back wages and liquidated damages for 296 workers. Uh, so here's some information, too. If you believe you are being taken advantage of, there is a um, there are some channels you can take if you want to report an employer or some type of business for this type of activity. But I thought this was pretty, pretty interesting stuff here. All right, let's let's go to a different tab here. Uh, so I want to share this. And this is the Apparel Contractor Guide to Compliance under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So I thought this was a pretty good um, little brochure here. Basically, kind of lays out that the federal minimum wage is currently six dollars and okay, oh seven. So it's currently a, is it still seven dollars and twenty five cents per hour? And I know that differs per state. It also details all of the overtime regulations. So if you do have questions or if you want to just read up on this, I thought this was a pretty good, like just a pretty good little resource here. It also talks about the hot goods, uh, pieces made in violation of the wage or overtime laws. You know, and that's the thing, like, I think we would kind of assume that things are better here in the United States, but there's still things like this happening here, and that is pretty unfortunate. Um, here's another good resource that I found, and that is... The, uh, this is from the U.S. Department of Labor blog, The Exploitation of Garment Workers uh, Threading the Needle on Fast Fashion. And this is where they found that this is the um, blog where they talked about the survey where they found that 80% of contractors were violating minimum wage and overtime laws. Um, it also talks about fast fashion. I thought this was pretty interesting. Uh, so it says, uh, consumers have a real choice to make. Fast fashion refers to trendy clothing that is quickly and cheaply produced to meet ever-changing consumer demand. Fast fashion garment makers copy ideas from high-end or celebrity fashion designers to sell the latest styles at cheaper prices. We've seen fast fashion all over the place here. These garment producers are caught in the never-ending cycle to rapidly produce the newest clothes or at lowest cost for consumers. 
As a result, many garment producers, manufacturers, and retailers sacrifice workers' wages to ensure that they can make a profit. Uh, so what can you do about it? Investing in more expensive pieces may be costly in the short term, but the higher quality means it won't be replaced as quickly, and you can't put a price on the benefits of ensuring fair wages for your fellow humans. Low-wage low garment workers are our priority. Uh, the wage in our division will not tolerate wage theft in the fashion industry. We are committed to protecting the workplace rights of garment workers and ensuring they receive the full wages they are due. We will use all available enforcement tools to hold manufacturers and contractors accountable when they violate these rights. The exploitation of workers is never an acceptable price to pay for the clothes on your back. So good information here. And uh, here is another, here is the, I believe this is the study. Okay, so if you want to read more about the study, um, the fiscal year 2022 survey also found that 32% of contractors paying garment workers piece rate wages, a practice prohibited by the state of California on as of January 1st, 2022. Okay, so they're doing something illegal. Contractors and manufacturers included in the survey produce garments for sale by national retailers that include bomb, Bombshell Sportswear, Dillard's, Lulu's, Neiman Marcus, Nordstrom, Socialite, Sticks, Stitch Fix, and Von Mar. In a particularly egregious case, division investigators learned a contractor paid garment workers as little as $1.58 per hour. Ugh. Oh, boy. Wow. Despite our efforts to hold Southern California's garment industry employers accountable, we continue to see people who make clothes sold by some of the nation's leading retailers working in sweatshops, said Wage and Hour Regional Administrator Ruben Rosales in San Francisco. Many people shopping for clothes in stores and online are likely aware, unaware that the Made in USA merchandise they're buying was in fact made by people earning far less than the U.S. law requires. Pretty interesting here. As part of the survey, the division conducted time and pricing studies and found that sewing fees paid by manufacturers to contractors were, on average, not enough for the contractors to properly pay their workers required minimum wages. Specifically, the studies determined the average sewing fee was $2.75 below the amount needed per garment for sewing contractors to comply with federal wage standards. Contractors who paid employees in compliance with the law received a higher sewing fee, ranging from $17.50 to $35 uh, per garment. Pretty interesting here. All right. The findings of the Southern California... Sorry, I need to cough real quick. I'm going to mute my... Okay. The findings of the Southern California Garment Survey highlight why greater outreach and stronger enforcement are needed to combat the inequities that exist in the garment and fashion industries. Rosales added, the hour and wage division will continue to work and meet with advocates and industry stakeholders and remain focused on finding ac holding accountable the manufacturers and retailers who reap significant profits while the people who did the hard work are often not paid their rightful wages. Um, so, yes, if you would like to, I believe there is a way that you can report. But yeah, you can definitely report things if you know anything or if you are one of these people affected. You can report this to the wage and hour division of the Department of Labor. So I thought that was good information. Um, and here is the website for the wage and hour division. And here, right on the homepage, how to file a complaint. So if you are one of these people affected... I would definitely encourage you to uh, consider filing a complaint because, you know, this if you're making less than minimum wage, that's that's illegal. And I know many of us have been in those situations and it's unfortunate that this is happening, um, but it's happening. And we've seen with these um, news releases that it's happening everywhere, not just overseas, not just in third world countries, but even in first world developed countries, including the United States. All right, let's check out some of your comments here. Okay, we've got quite a few here. Thank you, everyone, for watching this evening. Right, I've got Debbie here. Welcome, Debbie, representing from your sewing room. All right, let's see. 
All right. Hey, hey Jen. Uh, thank you, Jamie, for watching. How's the weather in Florida? It's freezing here in Texas. It's a little bit cold here. It's. I think it's going to be kind of chilly here in Florida. Um, obviously, no snow or anything, but it is fairly... It's a little cold for us, so we do have... We do have the heat on. All right, Nancy's here. Uh, another good reason not to buy cheap clothing. Yeah, and well, here's the thing. I do want to say this. Um, I get why people kind of have to buy cheap clothing. I think if you, I think if you're in a financial position to sew all of your own clothing or to make sure you are buying from ethical places, I think that's awesome. I think the reality, though, is that a lot of us kind of have to shop at like Target, Walmart, Forever 21, all of those places because, you know, ethically made clothing is pretty expensive. And I, I do understand that some people, actually a lot of people probably can't afford to do that. Um, but at the same time, I don't put the onus on the average person to fix all of that, I guess. All right. I'm afraid to figure out how terrible the fabric production industry is. You know, here's the thing. I mean, the good thing about making fabric itself is that that can be produced with machines. So that doesn't require as much human labor like making clothing does sitting at a sewing machine. I think one of the things to be concerned about, though, is the environmental impacts of like the dyes and the chemicals used in producing some of these fabrics, especially if it's uh, produced in countries without a lot of oversight like China or places like India, they don't have a lot of, um, they just don't have a lot of regulations if, as far as producing items. Um, that's one of the reasons why I personally, I've stocked a lot of Cloud9 fabrics myself because they have more eco-friendly uh, production standards. Uh, but, you know, so you do have to kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult, too, because you kind of have to research all of these companies and try to do the best you can, um, you know. And I, I think expecting everyone to be perfect is not very realistic, but we can try to do what we can do. And I think one of the most important things we can do is to um, try to buy less of things, not encourage over-hyper-consumerism, and using what we have as much as we can, Um Maybe doing some thrifting, trying to get things secondhand. I think that can make a difference. But in terms of a global scale, I don't know if there can be a lot of change unless you really fix some of these countries that have all of these terrible manufacturing practices. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's, you know, it's like, I think it's good to do what we can do. But I don't think, you know, realistically, I think we'd really have to fix things on a bigger scale. Okay, let's check out some more comments here. Okay, Lowe's has been sued so many times for labor code violations. Like Lowe's, the hardware store. Interesting. All right, in healthcare as well. Yeah, I'm sure that goes on. It goes on every... I, I think we're... Like, that's the thing. Exploiting employees happens in a lot of different industries, which is sad. But it happens in a lot of places. All right, we got Jeravia Lane. I love your channel. Jen, I always come to you first for the latest news in the craft world. Thank you very much for that. Okay, yeah, healthcare, no breaks in long-term care. And that's the thing. Uh, that's happened to me a lot is that I'll, my shift would be nine hours and we were supposed to get a one-hour lunch break, but you never did. That happens a lot. And I was still salary. So that happened, that happened to me at most of my employers. All right, Jamie, wow, I always thought TV jobs like that paid better. It seems like a stressful job, too, not worth it. Yeah, um, I don't I, I will say this, as a TV news veteran, I do not recommend this career track, especially not at this point. Uh, the jobs are even paying less when you compare it to, like, inflation and cost of living. Very few people in the media industry make six figures, like, very few people. Um, all right, only real fan. It's bad everywhere. I have a choice to do money or comp time. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it stinks. Things stink. Um, the employer can get out of benefits and pay with the self-contractor rhetoric. Yeah, we're seeing that a lot too, where employers will try to 
categorize someone as a 1099 employee, so they don't have to pay uh, any benefits or any of like, I think they don't have to pay like the unemployment stuff too, or like the, um, the like the payroll taxes or something. Um, but there are pretty strict standards that you have to have if you have a 1099 contractor and a lot of people are uh, pretty blatantly breaking that rule. All right, Jervia, about Joanne Fabrics, I talked to a lot of workers and they seem to not know about the headlines. That's interesting. It seems like a lot of people in um, the subreddit are talking a lot about what's going on at the corporate level. And it is unfortunate because the workers at Joanne's have nothing to do with why things are the way they are at Joanne's. Uh, exactly. Manx Cat says, yes, Jervia, the Joanne's employees know nothing here either in Minnesota. Wow. I mean, they have to be feeling the effects, right? Like, a lot of us have been reporting some real weird stuff going on at the stores. And they've had a few store closings. And I'm seeing headlines all the time about Joanne's. That is pretty crazy. All right, CM says, I worked in this industry for years and left it recently. The number of interviews I had that were at sweatshops in the U.S. That is really scary that there's... It is scary that there's sweatshops in the United States. That's pretty terrifying. Okay. All right. Christina says, this is just another way that the people of money exploit women and minorities. Will this ever end? What can we do uh, to make this right? Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't got the answers with, I don't have the answers to that one. Um, fabric production also uses lots of water. Exactly. And I think, um, um, that's, that's another interesting point. So I have a friend who was an environmental reporter for many years and, um, she did a report on pla like, you know, like plastic grocery bags versus like the reusable shopping bags, like especially the cotton ones. And a, a lot of people got upset over her, with her over this report, but, um, some, like experts found that the environmental impact of making those plastic grocery bags was a lot less than making like those cotton grocery totes. And the reason was because the cotton, to produce cotton, it requires massive amounts of water and that it requires a lot of resources. Um, you know, you also have to grow the cotton. So, you know, I know sometimes we can be like, oh, well, you know, paper is better than plastic or cotton is better than plastic. Uh, but she found that the, you know, the, like the amount of times you would have to use like the reusable cotton shopping tote to equate the environment, you know, to actually, you know, catch up to the low environmental impact of those like thin plastic grocery, like the grocery shopping bags. It was crazy. Um, so I think a lot of things can be sort of greenwashed and you might be like, oh, this is eco-friendly. And then you find out it's really like not eco-friendly at all. And I think sometimes people also like to feel good about things, but that may not be making that much of an environment, environmental impact. Um, and that's the thing. Yeah, cotton fabric requires massive amounts of water. So if you are using cotton fabric or making anything with cotton, you would have to use that one item so many times for it to equal the environmental impact of some types of plastics. Um, all right, we've got uh, television movie production also contributes to excess garments. And I think, honestly, those fast, like, I, uh, I've i been trying not to buy a lot of fast fashion. I don't shop at, like, Shein or Timu or any of those companies. Um, I also, honestly, if I'm being real with you, I think influencer marketing and like all of the influencer fashion stuff really contributes because you keep seeing all of these like YouTubers and Instagrammers constantly show off new clothes, new clothes, new clothes, new clothes, shopping hauls and all this other stuff instead of using like stuff they already have. I think a lot of what we're seeing on social media contributes to all of this excess consumerism. That's my honest opinion. All right, Amazon has lots of 1099 workers. And I actually have an Amazon warehouse kind of in my area. And I see a lot of people talk about uh, the jobs the jobs there because uh, they need so many employees. 
All right, Nancy says, Joanne's employees don't seem to know about anything in general these days. I went in and asked them about the Liberty Fabrics, and they never heard of Liberty Fabrics WTF. I know, right? All right, seems like everything is bad. You know, I not to black pill everyone, uh, but yeah, sometimes you can feel a little bit, you know, depressed about, <laughs> about the state of the world. That's true. That is true. <clears throat> Uh, you're absolutely right about all of the greenwashing, Jen. I did a lot of research about paper bag and plastic bags and cotton bags, and it's all just a wash. And that's the thing. My friend that was the environmental reporter, she had people so mad at her and angry with her about the the report. Uh, but that doesn't make her wrong. And that's the thing. Like, we may think something is better for the planet, and then you find out it's it's not. So, yeah, kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, Manx cat says slow fashion and low waist and that's the thing and the other thing I think can be a problem I almost feel like some sewing is turning kind of into fast fashion because I'm seeing a lot of people who feel like they have to stay on the content wheel of making more and more stuff just making stuff to make rather than out of practicality or because they actually need the item so a lot of people on social media who sew are sewing items just to make the item, just to take pictures of it, and then it ends up being like more waste. So I do think we could be more mindful about sewing for social media and don't just make an item to show people online. I, you know, and that's why I don't make as many projects as some other people, but I also don't really want to make something just to make it I would like to make projects because I actually um, need the item or I can find a recipient for it but I'm I'm trying to be more mindful of that sort of thing because I don't want to contribute to this whole stunt sewing phenomenon because I do think that's kind of a problem so all right so let's move on to the next story here all right let me find my tabs here and this is kind of an interesting I thought this was just interesting from the perspective of uh, a historical perspective um, if you're not aware I don't think I've really talked about this a lot. I'm, I'm really nerdy about historical stuff like how people lived in the past I love looking at historic homes seeing what life was like in previous generations I'm really into that kind of thing I find it fascinating and I love learning how people lived in past times. I'm just like obsessed. So I saw this article and I just uh, thought it was very interesting. Okay, so at first you're like, okay, so there is this former Singer sewing machine factory in, Eliz I believe it's in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And let me, let me show you some of this. Okay, so this was this massive fire earlier in the week in Elizabeth, New Jersey. It was at this huge building and it required a hundred New Jersey firefighters. This is super crazy. And this used to be a Singer sewing machine factory. So I, I'll kind of talk. Uh, the reason I wanted to talk about this is because um, I found the history behind this landmark pretty fascinating uh, so it says okay over 100 firefighters battled a blaze friday at a new jersey industrial park that was home to the singer sewing machine factory for more than a century a passerby reported the fire around 5 30 a.m no one was in the building and no injuries were reported uh, two roofs and one wall collapsed but the fire was burning in several buildings closest to the waterfront away from the oldest historical portion of the building the iconic portion of the building is not threatened, hope, nor do we expect it to be. All right, more than 100 firefighters were on the scene. It was four alarms, a classification requiring one of the highest levels of response in the city. Video from the scene shows a building engulfed in flames with firefighters surrounding the structure. A large, the large industrial complex is just south of Newark Liberty International Airport and across a strait from the New York City borough of Staten Island. A huge plume of smoke could be seen from Manhattan. Uh, the cause of fire is under investigation and the blaze itself could take several days to extinguish. In 1873, 
1873, the Singer Sewing Machine Manufacturing Company purchased 32 acres at the site and established the factory where it would make the iconic machines for more than a century. It was one of the, it was the largest workforce plant in the world for a single establishment at the time. Located on Elizabeth's waterfront near Newark Bay, the Singer Factory was a powerhouse of the Industrial Revolution, churning out sewing machines in the days when many people made their own clothes instead of buying them in stores. The plant also periodically was pressed into service during wartime, retooling itself to make munitions and parts for military airplanes and machinery during the two world wars, according to the British website uh, Singer Sewing Info. We're going to get to that website in a second. Uh, during World War II, with steel and, all right, this is like, all right, this is kind of frozen, and aluminum increasing the need for munitions, the manufacture of sewing machines at the plant was halted from 1942 until 1945. The facility continued to make them in stores. Okay, what is going on with this website? Okay. ABC6 is going rogue on me. I don't know what's, I don't know what's happening. Okay. All right. Um, after the war, the plant was cranking out 10,000 sewing machines a year and as many as 40,000 workers punched a clock there. But the business declined in the 1970s and 80s and the facility shut down in 1982. It was later divided into smaller sections to house small businesses. Public records show the building sold for $1 million in August. I just found this fascinating. I didn't even realize there was, I never even knew this uh, building existed, but I thought that was really just super interesting. Um, and I want to look a little bit more at the history of this factory. And I do own a vintage Singer sewing machine from the 50s. I have a Singer, it's like a Singer 2012, I believe. I'd have to check. I haven't used it in a while, but uh, it's a really beautiful machine. I think this thing is going to like outlive me probably. And what I really found interesting is when I looked into like the old vintage sewing machines, back when you kind of had to look, know how to sew in order to make your own clothing and household textiles, the buying a sewing machine was like the equivalent to paying for a car. Like you typically would buy it in installments because like, you know, these things were so expensive for what, they, like, now we're used to paying $200 for a sewing machine. Sewing machines were still, like, $200 back in, like, the 18, 1900s, but that was a lot more money to people back then. So people would buy sewing machines, like, on credit, and it was, like, a very big purchase, which I, you know, I just, like, I mean, that's just wild. It's, like, everyone kind of needing to have a sewing machine now and having the sewing mach machines be, like, $10,000. I just think that's fascinating. All right, so let's talk about the factory, though. So this is from singersewinginfo.co.uk. And uh, it talks, they, they have a page about the Singer factory in Elizabethport, New Jersey. Uh, so it says, in 1857, the first Singer so showroom and headquarters were at 458 Broadway in New York with three manufacturing small plants located around the city. With the original manufacturing plants unable to produce enough sewing machines to satisfy the expanding market, the Singer Company purchased a 32-acre plot of land at Elizabethport on the outskirts of the town of Elizabeth in New Jersey. In 1872, the Singer Manufacturing Company opened a large-purpose uh, state-of-the-art manufacturing facility. At the time, it was said to have been the largest factory in the world, devoted to the manufacture of a single product. So here is a picture of the factory, or a little like drawing. On May 7th, uh, 1890, the factory suffered a major fire. Okay, so it's no stranger to fires. Fortunately, much of the stock was left undamaged and the premises were soon rebuilt and production resumed. Uh, during the Great War of 1914 to 1918, the Singer Manufacturing Plant at Elizabethport produced 75 millimeter cannons and 45 millimeter automatic pistols. Quite a change. Other Singer factories at Kilbowie in Scotland and Podolsk in Russia also produced munitions, armaments, and artillery shells. With the start of World War II, the Singer plants in the U.S. and Scotland 
were again retooled for the war effort. This time they produced armaments ranging from pistols and anti-aircraft guns, I don't even know what that is, to castings for engine piston rings and wooden propeller blades. The major fire at Singer's Wood Store during the Clyde Bank Blitz meant that the Singer Cabinet Plant at Thurso, Quebec, Canada produced fine veneers for fitting onto airplane wings. In Germany, the Singer plant at Wittenberg produced uniforms and armaments for the German military. By the start of World War II, the Singer factory at Elizabethport was employing 5,000 workers, and the now 113-acre factory had 48 buildings with a total of 2.6 million square feet. The factory was an integrated, self-sufficient plant producing everything it needed to supply sewing machines. That's so fascinating to me. It also supplied sewing machine parts and the machinery to make the parts to other Singer factories around the world. During this time, shipping throughout Europe was limited and Elizabeth Port stepped in to provide the family sewing machines and machine parts normally produced at Clyde Bank. With the increase of steel and aluminum needed for the production of munitions, the U.S. production of civilian items, such as sewing machines, was stopped completely. From June 1942 until June 1945, Elizabeth Port completely ceased making any domestic sewing machines, although it continued to produce spare parts, needles, and limited runs of industrial machines. By the end of August 1945, production resumed and 10,000 Model 15s and 10,000 Model 66 domestic sewing machines were the first to come off the post-war production lines. Activity at the Elizabeth Port facility dropped off sharply in the late 1970s and 80s when the plant stopped making all but industrial sewing machines. The factory had less than 1,000 employees when its shutdown was announced in February 1982. After the shutdown, the original brick factory building built by Singer was converted to small industrial units. And um, here is, I found this on the, like, some government website. Uh, oh, on the Library of Congress. Here are some old, like, this is super fascinating. Here are some old pictures of the factory grounds and, like, the property. So I thought this was super, it was just super cool to see all the pictures. Okay, this is, all right. I'm going to have to, I guess I'm going to have to kind of re, like, zoom in every time. Okay, so here is the factory. I just think this is super cool to see old pictures. I mean, look at, this is like the apple of the 1800s, you know? And it's interesting how much technology and the world changes to where what was like the hot industry of one era becomes kind of defunct by the next generation. I just think this is super fascinating. But this is what it looks like. I just think it's super. You can kind of zoom in a little bit. So it really shut down in 1982. Here's another picture. I mean, what a look at, you know, just a really interesting look at history here. What do you guys think? I just thought this was interesting. I didn't really know much about this manufacturing building at all. But just super cool. I'm going to mute myself because I have to cough again. All right. But check it out. This is this place was hopping back in the day. I can't believe 5,000 employees. That's so crazy. I hope the building is okay, though. I, and I wonder, like, I guess they turned it into some just commercial, you know, commercial space. But super interesting. I just wanted to share that with you because I just found it really interesting this week. And I, you know, I heard about the fire and I was like, that's pretty crazy. And then I looked more at the property and I just thought it was pretty, pretty cool. So I just wanted to share that. But let's read some more comments here. Okay. Okay, all right, Nancy, this is regards to the, like, social media sewing uh, stuff. Yes, when I see content creators churning out three or four garments a week, I think that's just as bad as fast fashion. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Not to be too judgy, because I, here's the thing. They're kind of fighting, like, the algorithms and the constant need for posting. So I can, I can sort of understand it. 
but you're right. Like at a certain point, it's like, how is this better than just buying clothes? You know, if you're using all this fabric and you're just kind of feeding the wheel, you know. All right, Debbie says, I have a singer, 1591. Her name is Annabelle. Very cool. All right, very awesome. All right, Manx Cat says, Workhorse sewing machines love the old singers. I know, me too. My vintage singer is such a beautiful machine. It's black with like the gold, uh, gold lettering on it, and it's just so beautiful. Back when sewing machines were made of metal, you had to oil them and maintain them. Now so many are made of plastic. True. Very true. All right, Eva says, that is so cool to know about the factory. Wonder why they sold the building. You know, I don't know, probably just like a business. I mean, $1 million isn't even that much money for a building. It probably needs a lot of, uh, I'm guessing it probably needs a lot of renovation or maybe it has some structural problems because that's very cheap for commercial property. All right, Lisa's here. I found a, f a featherweight machine in a storage unit I was supposed to clean out. I was told I could have anything I wanted and take the rest to a dump or to charity. That's an awesome find. And those vintage machines, if you can get one and get it fixed up in, in good working order, they'll be really good machines. All right, I have a 1950s, 1960s sewing machines that I got, machine that I got from my mom. I have nowhere to get it serviced locally, and it weighs a ton. I need to put it in a pickup to take it. Yeah, they are, those things are super heavy. They are very heavy. Okay, on another channel, there was a brief video on that factory. Yeah, I just thought the factory seemed super cool. I'd love to see maybe some more old pictures of, like, the inside or what it was like when it was, uh, like, a factory. You know, I'd love to see more of what it was like. If you want to read an interesting fiction, I recommend The Sewing Machine by Natalie Fergie. It's a little confusing at first, but comes together. That's cool. That's cool. All right, Manx Cat was American-made outsourcing. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, right? Like, I was like, I was like, I've never heard of that building. That's cool. And then I was looking more into it. I was like, that's pretty fascinating. And I love that I could, I love that I was able to find those pictures at the Library of Congress. I thought that was really neat. And at one point, that was like the largest factory in the world that made one particular product. Super cool. Our Eva says, I've been hoping to find an old singer at Goodwill. Who knows? One day. Lo I hope you do. Um, another good place, you might be able to check eBay. eBay or like maybe check estate sales um, and garage sales. All right. Debbie says, I noticed some creators are sewing for others. I personally, if I if I don't need something for, my, for myself, I will ask people I know like, hey, do you need this? Or can I give you this? Um, just so it's not just making something to make it. Someone has to pay the property tax. Very, yeah, maybe they got some back taxes. I have no, you know, we have no idea. I mean, New Jersey probably has fairly high taxes overall. So I'm going to guess, uh, yeah, I'm going gu to guess it's fairly expensive to operate a business in New Jersey. All right, read the sewing machine. It's about a singer and all the stories, owners. It goes through. Oh, that sounds really cool. Um, if you guys are looking for a good uh, movie, there's a movie on Amazon Prime Video called The Royal Tailor, and it's a Korean film, but it has English subtitles, and it's about literally a guy who's the tailor for uh, the king and, like, the royal family. It was a really good movie, and it was just a beautiful, it was a very beautiful film, and I really enjoyed it, and it was basically about how this guy, like, changed the fashion of you know, old Jos the like Joseon era of Korea. It was a really good movie, though. Very well done. And I really like, I just really enjoyed uh, the movie. I was like, this is kind of random, but it was a really good film. So if you are looking for a like movie about sewing, also the, um, there was that one with Kate Winslet that was good. Oh, it was like The Dressmaker. That one was actually, it had kind of a, you know, it wasn't like a super uplifting movie, but it was a pretty interesting movie. Um, and I liked the fashion in it. So, The Dressmaker with Kate Winslet. All right. Uh, Offer Up and Facebook have lots of vintage sewing machines. Good suggestion. Yeah, Facebook Marketplace, that sort of thing. Okay, Hillary says, a third to read the sewing machine book. It was so great. Okay, so what was it called? The Sewing, the sewing Machine by now. Okay, I'll have to check that out. All right, Tired of Trolls, I like the username, by the way, says, I tend to use clothing to make other clothes. I saw a creator making a Regency dress out of an old sari. Not, 
Not that I live where you can find... Okay, so you don't live where you can play, find you saris. I mean, saris are beautiful fabrics. So if you could find one, um, that would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. Right, I'm going to get some water real quick here. Okay, apologies. I just, all right, you may have seen that. Water went down the wrong pipe here. And I just like spit out my water. That was fun. Hold on a second here, guys. <coughs> I'm going to need like a minute here. Hold on. Yeah, I muted myself. I I was taking a sip of water, went on the wrong pipe, and I literally just like projectile coughed up some water. Okay. <coughs> that happens to me a lot. Especially if I'm talking a lot, like it'll just start I'll start feeling like very plugged up. <coughs> Jeez. I know, that was embarrassing. Maybe we'll do that as like a replay on Instagram or something. I don't know. Man, that was embarrassing. Okay. <clears throat> I know. Ooh. Hey, it's live, you know? Anything goes. I'm, I've had some of the most embarrassing stuff like that happen to. Like, if I'm with new people or something, or something important, this type of thing will happen. And you're like, okay. <laughs> oh, geez. <coughs> yeah, hopefully I don't die. If I start, like, choking or something, call 911. <sighs> All right, hold on. I'm going to mute myself because I have to cough again. Okay, my eyes are really <laughs> watering too. I'm just like, geez, this is embarrassing. All right, so of course, everyone since the last show wants another update on Joanne Fabrics. And whenever I post anything on this channel having to do with Joanne Fabrics, it gets a ton of clicks. I can understand why. I also want to clarify. I've been reporting on what's going on with Joanne Fabrics from a corporate level. Obviously, a lot of us have a high interest in this business because this is one of the major places we can shop for fabric, sewing supplies, craft supplies. And if something were to happen jo to Joanne's, our options for other shopping at physical stores is fairly limited. I also want to be clear, I'm not... I'm personally not rooting for, like, the demise of Joann's or anything like that. I don't want jo I, I don't want Joann's to go out of business. I hope they can get it together. I hope their leadership team can make some changes to right the ship. Obviously, Joann's has some problems. And I don't want people to think I'm talking about this particular business because... I don't want it to exist. That's not true at all. 
the reason I wanted to call attention to this particular company is because I think they need to change and because I don't want them to go out of business. So I'm trying to um, just report on what's going on. This is called the sewing report. Um, but I've, I've gotten some folks who kind of seem to think that I'm doing this to like try to be negative and I'm not trying to be negative, but I am going to be talking about topics that people care about. Obviously this is something that has a high level of interest to people. Um, and there's a lot going on with it. So I'll, you know, I'm trying to be very fair in the reporting, I'm not trying to unnecessarily like bash Joanne's or try to, again, I'm not like reveling in their, their failures. I'm actually very disappointed as a, a longtime customer at Joanne's and someone, I don't want Joanne's to go away. I hope they can change. And I, I think by talking about this business, hopefully we can maybe be heard by this corporate leadership so that they will listen to customers. They will listen to us. So that's why I'm doing this. But I, some people seem to think I'm, you know, like really wanting them to not exist. And that's just not true. So I'm going to talk about what people have an interest in and what's important within the sewing industry. And this is a very important part of the sewing industry. I've been shopping at Joann's for decades. Um, I hope they stick around. I really do. And I hope they can improve the business so that they can continue to exist. So let's talk about the latest with Joann's because there was a new article put out by thestreet.com. They've been doing some pretty good reporting about Joann's. So let's chat about the latest uh, okay, analyst, beloved retailer headed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Ugh, Joanne's, come on, come on. All right, it's been a very rough period for retailers with a number of big names going under last year. Over the past 12 months, the retail world was rocked by big names going under and a couple of others just barely surviving. In most cases, you can blame the financial damage done by the COVID pandemic, which forced many companies to burn cash while selling very little. Bed Bath & Beyond led the list as its merchandise was non-essential during the pandemic. Yeah, that's very true. People were improving their homes, but that tended to be things like painting rooms or building home offices, not upgrading their bedding or getting new towels. Christmas tree shops also uh, suffered a, ch a Chapter 7 bankruptcy liquidation because it simply could not operate for months. It was a store-based business and it simply never recovered from the lockdown period when its stores were either closed or sparsely visited. That's the same fate that befell Tuesday morning. A similar, albeit less loved chain that also used the treasure hunt heavy discount model. Both Party City and David's Bridal narrowly survived their bankruptcy filings, which were caused because people basically did not have parties or large weddings for over a year. It's hard to sell wedding dresses and party supplies when people are hunkered down in their homes, afraid to see other people, uh, but both of those companies managed to find the money needed to continue. Now a company that should have been a pandemic winner stands on the brink of collapse and its pl prospects are bleak. According to Credit Safe head of brand Regini Be Bella, Joanne faces deep financial problems. In theory, people stuck at home should have been good for the sewing enthusiasts and other hobbyists that make up Joanne's customer base. It's possible, however, that even when stores were opened, those customers opted to buy their supplies online. That could have shifted some of Joanne's regulars to Amazon, and the ease of buying from the online giant may have changed customer behavior. It's also possible that some of the company's fan base died or changed their hobbies during the COVID period. That's bleak. Some of their customer base died. I mean, I guess that's technically possible. Uh, no matter what the reason is, Bella thinks the situation is dire. Given the struggles Joanne has had with cash flow, its inability to stay current with many of its bills, its declining sales in fiscal year 2023, and its $1 billion debt load, our credit safe algorithm has classified the company as a high risk of becoming seriously delinquent on payments and could be headed for bankruptcy very soon. 
Without strong leadership, still no permanent CEO, it could be hard to write the ship, she told the street uh, via email. I think those are all pretty valid points. I also particularly found her the speculation about maybe a lot of those customers shifting to Amazon or shopping online. I, I can definitely see that. Joanne has a lot of risks. Bala pointed out that Joanne has been late in paying its bills, something which often foresee, foreshadows a bankruptcy filing. Credit safe data shows that Joanne struggled to make on-time payments in the second half of 2023. Most of that time, about 20 to 31 percent of its bills were paid late, one to 30 days, while about one to eight percent of its bills were paid late, 31 to 60 days, she shared. Sales have also been falling. Net sales declined by 4.1% compared to the same period last year to $539.8 million, with total comparable sales decreasing 4.1%, the company shared in its fourth, earning, fourth quarter earnings report. Joanne's interim leaders, as all executives do in this situation, tried to paint a positive picture. We are pleased with our third quarter results and importantly have increased our top line full year outlook. Our third quarter appeared to focus on operational retail fundamentals with an agile, data-driven approach, helping us to win in our core categories, while over-delivering on the impl implementation and exec execution of our focus. Simplify and Grow Cost Savings initi Initiative Chief Customer Officer Christopher DiTullio said during the Q3 earnings call. Despite all of that corporate-speak happy talk, Bala sees the company's risk of bankruptcy increasing. Joanne's is rated as a high risk. Based on Credit Safe's risk algorithm, which takes into account both trade payment data and financial results, Joanne is deemed to be a high risk, D, meaning it could be at risk of bankruptcy. Its risk score dropped from C to D in July of 2023 and has stayed there since, she added. I thought that was a very good article. And yeah, it looks like Joanne has a lot of debt. They've ha been having trouble paying their bills and um, sales have declined. And it seems like them cutting the workforce, laying people off and not having the stores staffed adequately at many locations from what many of you are reporting. That's also not going to help people have a good customer experience. And currently the stock price uh, last week, I think it was at 46 cents. Now it's at 47 cents, so it's not doing too much better. And look at, yeah, at the high, 2021, $16, now 47 cents. I mean, that's not good. I know they're, they're at risk of being delisted off of the stock exchange. You can also look at their financials on Google and, yeah, check everything out. Everything's sort of, yeah, things aren't going super hot for them. As of October 2023, um, net income is down, net profits are down, operating income is down, revenue is down, cost of revenue is down. So, yeah, I don't know. I I wish, and you know what? I wish I had better news to report. Um, things are just not going particularly well for Joann's, and I think a lot of us are kind of, you know, myself included, we're worried that Joann's is... Um, Maybe at the risk of bankruptcy, I you know who knows what the future holds for Joanne's, but this is uh, this is not good. All right, I'm gonna cough real quick. Sorry, just had to cough again. All right, let's check out some of the comments now. But um, that's the latest with Joanne's. I know everyone's very interested. So I upload, you know, after the live stream last week, I uploaded some clips from the show. And the Joanne's one just got, like, way more views than anything else. So obviously people are very interested in this topic. So, I'll, you know, I'll continue to do it. All right, Jamie says, I haven't been to Joanne's in a while. I will need to go and check it out. It's usually messy and dirty. But I'm curious how stocked it is. I will repost back. Yes, please do. All right. It bums me out that our area is full of quilt shops. It seems like folks in the UK have much more garment sewing fabric stores. That's true. We don't have a ton of 
garment fabric stores, like fashion fabrics, unless you're in certain areas. Like if you're in New York and L.A., they seem to have pretty good fabric districts. But like I'm in the Tampa area. We don't have like a lot. I think we got like one or two. Uh, we need a new fabric store run by those who sew. That, yeah. I think the problem is that, you know, you know, and I've even run into this myself and I've talked about this. Uh, selling fabric is pretty tough business-wise. And I only do it online. If I had a physical store, it would be much more difficult because I would have much higher overhead. So I think that's sort of the problem with uh, wanting to like start a new fabric store is that it's, I think it would be very hard to stay in business. All right, try Farmhouse Fabrics. Better quality, much better service. Hey, thank you for that. All right, Charlene's here. I own three old singers and use them all. They are great. Thank you for that. Denise says, it is worrisome about Joanne's. Hopefully it will become stable again. That stock price is crazy low. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess a lot of people, you would have been good to short Joanne's stock, which is kind of sad, but it's, you know, that's the reality. All right, Hobby Lobby is a poor replacement, even as overpriced, as corrupt as Joanne's is. All right, went to the yarn sale at Joanne's. They had very little yarn. Okay, that's, yeah, the yarn sale, they don't have any yarn. That's, and I've been getting all these Joanne sale emails where it's like everything's like 70% off or something. I'm like, what is going on? I don't mind getting my supplies online, but I really do like to buy my fabric in person because I like to touch it and stretch it and all of the things. And that's true. And especially if the fabric is expensive and you have not purchased that type of fabric before, it's a little bit risky to buy it online, especially if it's like $20 a yard or something. You know, you don't really want it. If you get it and you're disappointed in it, you know, I don't know. It's tough. I see it as you bringing attention to the matter. It may actually bring more people to the store. Well, thank you, Jamie. And again, I'm not, that's the thing. I'm not trying to be like all doomsday about Joanne's. Uh, but it's pretty clear this company has some problems. And this is called the Sewing Report, so that's what we, that's what we do here. Um, the Joanne's 30 minutes away closed because the building owner of the mall would not fix a leak in the roof. That's nuts. And now I go an hour away just to go to Joanne's. Wow. The Joanne's is too expensive, and they do bait-and-switch tactics on sale items. Yeah. So sad about Christmas tree shops. Love that place. I've never been, I've never really heard of Christmas tree shops. I don't think we had one near me or anything. Uh, Joanne's is nothing like it was in the 80s, 90s. Overpriced, cheap fabric, lousy checkout service. Clerk, clerks don't know where stuff is. Fed up with the place. I hear you there. Uh, yes, Manx went to the store to buy a Singer quilting foot kit that was $45.99 online on sale. Go to the store. It's on sale for $55 from $600. What? For $600, the prices were completely different. That is crazy. Wow, that's kind of a harsh order. Yeah, it's not, I mean, it's not very optimistic for sure. Not optimistic. Uh, it sounds like they need new leadership. I would, yeah, I would probably agree with you. Uh, maybe corporate is just trying to position itself for a sell-off. I've seen that theory, and uh, I think that makes sense if they're trying to sell it or, like, try to squeeze as much cash out of the business and then sell it off i don't know i've seen that and i that would make sense yeah well the ceos make triple comma salaries i know right and meanwhile i was making twenty thousand dollars as a morning like producer i'm like geez how do i become a ceo i need to recover my dining room chairs and my nearest joann's only had three appropriate fabrics if you counted the pleather yeah i'm I'm not like a huge pleather fan. I And I hate, this is a pet peeve. I hate when people call pleather f like faux leather or vegan leather. I'm like, I feel like v calling it vegan leather almost greenwashes that. It's like, it kind of makes it sound like it's good for the planet, but it's like plastic and you're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I uh, don't know if Hancock's was nationwide, but in Alabama when Hancock's closed, Joanne kind of started on the downslide. Whether from lack of concern by corporate management, lack of people, sewing, or question mark. Yeah, I remember when Hancock's... Hancock's was a pretty good store. Because I used to shop there a lot. And then it closed. That was pretty... Pretty... Pretty uh, disappointing. When a hedge fund runs a fabric store, it doesn't end well. Yeah, right? Uh, for online fabric, it's best to buy... 
a swatch. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, if they offer, if a fabric store offers a swatch, I think that's a good option. It might cost you a little bit extra, but at least you're not spending all of that money on like five yards of fabric and only to find out you don't like it. Ah, uh, yes, the old black hat and tan head singers are fabulous for all kinds of sewing. Plus, there are YouTube videos on how to fix, repair, maintain them, even for the mechanically disinclined. Yes, that's very, very true. Very true. <clears throat> so, I obviously don't know what's in the future for Joanne's, but I just keep seeing more and more articles and about them being on the brink of bankruptcy, having financial problems, and the stock price is not doing well. And lots of people online I'm seeing are reporting problems at the store, like problems with their online orders, problems with the buy now, pick up at the store option. So, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. I I hope they can get it together. I I really don't know. Um, but, yeah. Oh, we do have a couple comments on other platforms. Uh, our Brent says, Howdy, new to the channel. Really just trying to start sewing. It seems you do podcasting as well, Google. I, Brent, I have a lot of beginner beginner sewing videos on my main YouTube channel, The Sewing Report. This is Sewing Report Live. So the, um, this is going to be like a lot of podcasting. But if you go to Sewing Report on YouTube, I have a lot of beginner videos on how to use a sewing machine and how to do like very basic stuff. So if you are new, I do have two YouTube channels and I am multi-streaming on a couple different platforms um, as just Sewing Report. But um, we, so we do a couple different things here, but I do have a lot of like basic videos on the main YouTube channel. So I would definitely recommend that. Okay. I follow Andy Tube and fixes old singers. Very cool. Very cool. <clears throat> All right. So Oh, I need to share my screen again. All right, what's going on here? All right. I think we're good. Okay, so guys, I've been I've been getting back into the the K drama vibe and I I got to I got to talk about these shows. So if you're not into Korean dramas, I totally understand. If you don't really know what they are, um, I will say this. Uh, Korean entertainment is way better than anything coming out of Hollywood right now. So if you're kind of tired of all of the reboots, the lame stuff coming out of, you know, Hollywood, uh, you know, are we really ready for like Fast and Furious 18? I don't know. But I have personally been gravitating a lot more towards uh, Korean TV shows. And I'll kind of explain why. Oh, and by the way, before we get any further, I do want to point out right here next to me, I do have my Sew Tights magnetic storage stand next to me. The wonderful friends at Sew Tights sent this to me to try out. It's very cool. I use Sew Tights magnets a lot in my sewing. This is not sponsored, but I am a Sew Tights affiliate, and this is one of Sew Tights' new products. You can order this. You can also order Sew Tights. You can order the magnetic cutting system on the website. A link is in the description box. Again, this is not sponsored. I am an affiliate. You can get 15% off your order at Sew Tights with coupon code Sewing Report. I also sell some of the Sew, type pro Sew Tights products myself in the Sewing Report Etsy shop, but... I have been really like loving this thing. I just think it's really cute to look at. And this is where you can uh, store all of your magnets. I just use, I use these things all the time. They're great for paper piecing. You can use them for, I use them f to hold things down when I'm doing embroidery projects, all kinds of stuff. But I'm a big Sew Tights fan. Uh, so I did just want to give them a quick shout out. Again, not sponsored, uh, but these are one of my like affiliate partners. And it's a really great company. It's owned by two sisters. And I just really like these folks. Um, and they sent me this trap. Very cool. But, okay. Oh, oh, we got some K-drama fans in the house here. All right. And thank you all if you got to run. I Again, you can kind of come in and out. And if you're watching on the replay, this is kind of easy. Hopefully, this is like easy viewing here. Okay, yeah. Goblin Man, that is one of my 
that's like probably one of my that's definitely in my top 10 i don't know about top five um goblin is a great show so there's a few places you can watch korean uh tv shows so they're called korean dramas or k-dramas and i think they sort of get a bad rap for being like just like lifetime movies like i think a lot of people think k-drama and they think like hallmark channel type stuff or lifetime movies but the truth is korean tv shows have many different genres different vibes uh, not all of them are like chick flicks like th- people think they're all chick flicks and that's not true at all in fact i recommended earlier today i recommended the show called vincenzo on netflix to somebody and vincenzo is like the last the vincenzo is anything but a chick flick um it's a very like gritty show it's you know not very family friendly it's more it's you know kind of more action stuff uh but the thing here's what i like about the korean tv shows that i feel like i'm not getting from any like western tv um i feel like the storytelling is more original Everything coming out of Hollywood is now like a reboot or like, you know, like it's like a spinoff of something. I feel like there's not a lot of original content coming out of Hollywood or like Los Angeles with the entertainment industry. So I feel like the Koreans are really kind of one upping the Americans in that sense. In full disclosure, I am Korean, but I don't speak Korean or understand the language. So I know people are kind of put off by watching for like international shows with subtitles. You really get like it really is not a big deal. Like you're like, okay, it's cool. So it's very it doesn't take you a long time to get used to watching stuff with subtitles at all. In fact, now I enjoy watching any show with a subtitle because I don't know if it's just me, but I've been noticing a lot of even English stuff. The characters are like mumbling and you can't understand what they're saying. So you almost need to have the subtitles on just to understand what's what the, what the script is saying because you're like I didn't even understand what they were talking about because they're not speaking very clear. I don't know if it's just me. That's just a gripe I have with a lot of TV shows and movies is that the dialogue is so mumble jumbly that I just I'm like I don't even know what they just said. So those are super fun. I think the storytelling is much better. I think they, they're doing better with telling like a more heartfelt story. Um, like it's not all like a lot of American stuff I feel like is done for shock value or like like they'll have violence just to have violence but there's no purpose in it or like sex scenes and that sort of thing. Um, I appreciate that the K-drama tries to have like a deeper meaning for things. And I feel like the story, there's just better storytelling overall. I think better writing, uh, great acting, great characters, great cinematography, very good soundtracks. Um, So if you have not ever checked out a Korean TV show, guys, you're missing the boat. I'm telling you, you are missing out. You're sleeping on it because these things are amazing. Um, And I will say this, I know... The show Squid Game was super popular a couple years ago. And it kind of frustrated me as a longtime K-drama fan because I felt like Squid Game was kind of a mediocre show. I didn't think it was that great. I thought it was okay and it was watchable, but I just felt like there were so many other shows that were better that it kind of annoyed me that that was like the one that got so hyped up here in America. And I was like, guys, there's better out there. Watch Vincenzo, watch Goblin. You know, watch uh, Descendants of the Sun. Like, there's just so many shows that I think are just far superior to Squid Game. And a lot of people will never watch them. So, there's a lot of stuff that's on Korean TV shows. So, they have them everywhere now. They, um, Amazon Prime has a bunch of them now. Netflix has a bunch. Uh, Disney Plus has a few. And there is a streaming site called Viki, V-I-K-I where that has like a lot of K-dramas, not all of them, but a lot of them. And some of them you can find on multiple platforms. So like some of them on Netflix are also on Amazon Prime. Um, But there's some really good shows out there. If you need recommendations, ask me in the comments or in the chat. I'll be happy to uh, share with you. I personally tend to like the K-dramas made after like 2016. I don't know why. I've watched some older ones, but I just like the newer ones personally better 
Um, so the two I'm watching right now are, um, all right, so I started watching this one called um, My Man is Cupid, and it's, so both of these are on Amazon Prime, so I feel like that's pretty accessible, because a lot of us have Amazon Prime. Um, so this one, like, the premise of it is, like, pretty, the premise of this is kind of strange. So this one is it's about a guy who's a, like, he's basically Cupid, you know, like fairy Cupid, like shooting hearts into people and getting people to fall in love. Literally, he's Cupid. And he, I'm a little bit confused, and I'm hoping this is, like, cleared up because some of this, like, the overall plot, I still don't understand. Um, so he, the whole thing about this show is that because he's a Cupid, he can't be in, a, like, a relationship with a woman or something. But here's the thing. He's not the only Cupid. So there's, like, four Cupids. I know. You're like, why is there more than one? I thought there was only one. So, like, he, it's this guy in the movie uh, poster here, in the TV show poster. There's, like, four Cupids. It's him and three other guys, and they're all roommates. And they've been, like, banished. So because he got involved with a woman back in the day... He's been banished to, like, do service on Earth for 500 years. I still don't really understand that. And because of what he did, his three friends all have to do the same thing. And they're all constantly mad at him because they have to do this, like, service on Earth, too. So they make him do all of the housework and the cooking and stuff. Um... Here's what's strange about this show. So his love interest in the present day is uh, a veterinarian. And the veterinarian has had bad luck with romance as well because every time she tries to get involved with a guy, he gets physically injured, which they haven't explained that either. Like, why does that happen? So she meets this Cupid guy, and he's the first guy she ever meets that doesn't, get physically injured when he's around her so she's like really attracted to him i'm a little confused by why there's like four cupids and the other thing so one of the cupids he shapeshifts into a, a dog like i i don't get that so like every once in a while he'll be like the dog or he'll be like a person this guy has like bleached blonde hair and then he shapeshifts into a like a Labrador Retriever. And the Cupid guy ends up crossing paths with the veterinarian because he takes his dog Cupid friend to the vet a lot. So that's weird. Uh, it's quite funny and quirky. And so far I like the show. I hope the ending doesn't suck. But the show is very bizarre. Like I like the whack. The show is very weird. With like the Cupid guy. And then one of the other Cupids... Um, they all have wings, too, but the wings aren't always there. And then the wings on the one guy, he has, like, the short wings. So everyone's calling him short wings on Reddit. And this guy has never had a girlfriend. Oh, and the other Cupids can date, but just not this guy. So I don't understand that. Like, why is he the only one that can't have a girlfriend? Um, but this guy, the, the guy with the short wings, has never had a girlfriend. So, um... Part of the storyline is that he, I'm not kidding you, he goes to a dating academy and he pays $3,500 for this dating academy, which I'm like, why, what the heck? And he is a little, this guy is a little socially awkward. So I don't know what's going to happen at the end of this thing, but um, so far I like it. I just hope the ending is okay. But here's the funny thing is that I, I thought this thing, I typically like to watch K-dramas. So here's the thing with K-dramas. There's typically only one season. So this is not something where it's like 18 seasons like lost and you have to watch it forever. There's only one season and there'll be between 12 and 16 one hour episodes. So the commitment for viewing is like fairly short. So it's something you could watch in like a week or a long weekend if you're really committed. So it's not something that you have to dedicate a ton of time to watching, which is in my opinion, a plus. It's like watching a really long uh, movie, which is cool. So the thing with this show, though, is I thought it was already off the air and I thought there were 12 episodes. So I get to episode 12 and there were like 20 minutes left. And I'm like, I don't know how they're going to wrap all of this up in 20 minutes because 
they haven't really resolved a lot of the storylines. Um, and then I Googled and I, f I come to find out that the show is still on the air and there's actually 16 episodes. So I get to the ep end of episode 12 and I didn't realize there were still four more episodes to go. So this show still has like, they aired episodes 13 and 14 this weekend. I'm actually going to wait until the show is completely over so I can just watch it in one chunk. And the only reason I started watching this show to begin with is because I thought it was already done and, and then I realized it wasn't done. So, so far I like it. It's, I like the wacky, it has a lot of like weird wackiness in it. Um, I like the actors okay. I just hope it doesn't, have, I hope it doesn't have a sad ending. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm a little, in. it kind of, there's like three different timelines. It's like 500 years ago and then it's like 1993 and then present day. So they're going to hopefully wrap everything up. There's also a serial killer in it, which is zany um, as well, because like they already have enough going on as if they need a serial killer storyline, but it's it's in there. So there's that. Um, the other show. So then once I realized the show still had four more episodes, I was like, well, screw it. I guess I'll, you know, try to watch like another show, you know, while I'm waiting for this one to wrap up. Right. So then I saw this other show on Amazon Prime and I was like, well, you know, screw it. I'll, I'll check this out, right? So um, this is the other show I started watching and this one is called Heartbeat and it's about a uh, vampire. It's, it's a, well, there are several vampires and it's, it's about this guy who, um, he's a vampire and he has something go wrong with uh, this lady love from a past era. So he wants to be with her and he thinks she's like going to reincarnate or something. So in, in the 1920s, this guy um, decides he's going to try. So he wants to become a human so he can love like a human does. And he wants his heart to beat or something like that. Which is kind of funny because the guy who plays the main vampire. So his name is um, ok ok Octakion. I'm probably pronouncing that really wrong. Um... So this guy, um, the actor who plays the vampire is in a boy band called 2PM. And they had a song called Heartbeat back in the day. So that's kind of funny. And he's a really good actor. He does comedy really well. So this vampire in the 1920s, he starts taking life advice from a cat which is kind of, I don't know, he's very trusting in, in this cat. So it's a cat that turns into an old guy. And this old guy slash cat starts telling him, like, if he sleeps in this particular coffin for 100 years, he'll turn into a human. So the guy does that. He makes all these preparations. He lives in a mansion in Korea. And he basically goes to sleep in the 1920s and he wakes up in the present day. So like the 2020 era. Um, so a lot of the like humor in this show is he basically gets like culture shock because he's from the 1920s and then he wakes up now. What I found funny about this show is that typically when you see TV shows or movies about vampires, the vampires are all rich because they're immortal and they've had all this time to like grow wealth and all this other stuff. So like if you watch shows like True Blood or, you know, I'm sure there's other ones. But the vampires that are really old, like, you know, they bought property back in the 1800s or something. They're rich because they invested in the stock market, you know, hundreds of years ago. They've just had a lot of time to amass large amounts of money. So the vampires in these shows are typically very like rich people. What I find hilarious about this show is that the vampires are are all poor in this show and they have financial difficulties. So I found that pretty hilarious about this particular show is that the vampires all feel like the humans are sucking them dry because of like taxes and, you know, all this other stuff. They, they, they work these like menial jobs and none of them have any money. So I did find that pretty hilarious about this show. A lot of people were kind of upset. Apparently the ending, people were very upset about the ending. I have like two episodes to go. Um, so I'm, I know what's coming, but so far I enjoyed the earlier episodes of him like 
having to deal with living in the 2020 era with like his 1920s knowledge. Like he doesn't know anything about like getting a driver's license or like shopping. You know, he doesn't understand like credit cards or cell phones and stuff. So that was kind of funny. Uh, so those are the two shows I'm currently watching. And they're both on Amazon Prime. I mean, I would say they're worth watching. I, you know, again, I, I think a lot of people were sad because this Heartbeat show was billed as like a romantic comedy. And I th- think the ending is not going to be very uplifting. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, but that's what's going on in uh, K-drama world. So, but yeah, the good stuff here. All right, let's read some of the comments. Uh, Denise says, I like a good uh, detective story. You know, you might like, um, let me think here. There's a lot of show. I'm trying to think of stuff with like crime. I'll have to think about that. Um, there are a lot of like police type shows in Korea, so you might like some of those. All right, I watched a lot of the older K dramas from the early 2000s to 2010s. Yeah, fun times. Telenovelas are also fun. Yeah, I've heard. I don't watch any, but they do look fun. All right, Sarah, a lot of the newer ones are based on the Webtoon comics. Yep, I've been reading like Mary. My- yeah, I want to watch Mary, my husband. But I'm going to wait till like, that one's also on Amazon Prime. But I, I like to wait until the show is over, over. So I'm not, like, hanging, you know. So that one's still on the air, but that one looks pretty good, too. And a lot of them have, like, a serial killer storyline for some reason. I've been watching a French show called Astrid. Really interesting characters with focus on characters on the autistic spectrum. That sounds pretty interesting. How do you watch French shows? Are they on the streaming services? Or where do you, where do you get them? Yes, see, right? I put closed captions on so I can understand what they... Like, even with a lot of English shows, I watch them, and the way they talk, like, I just don't even know what they said. It's And that's kind of frustrating. Yeah, same. I even watch YouTube with captions. Yeah, it's, like, better to watch anything with captions so at least you really understand what they actually, you know, said. I can get into the subtitle show. Once you start watching, you get what is going on. My husband uses the subtitles for English shows. See, I'm not alone here. Is it just me or I feel like a lot of like the dialect in these shows is just hard to understand no matter what language is on it. Lol, they couldn't promote a show that was better, a lot better than American. There's too much money invested in American to lose. Here's the thing, though. These Koreans, man, they are uh, they're 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 moving in on the the Western turf here and um I mean, that's the thing. Koreans, they even have, like, training camps for people in the entertainment industry. So they're, like, trying to outwork, you know, all the Americans. I have to go, got to watch Cupid. So it is, like, really, like, the show is actually pretty good. Um, And it's, like, real, like, the guy that turns into the dog. I'm, like, I don't even know. Also, the dog, they put this dog in the most ridiculous, wacky outfits. Like, when they're walking the dog, the dog will be wearing like a base, like a jacket and like a baseball cap. Like the 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 dog will be wearing sweaters and hats, and that's pretty funny. And a lot of the storylines will involve them having to take the dog to the vet because like he ate chocolate or something. And the funny thing is about that character is the dog Cupid character is like a real ladies' man when he's in human form, but then he turns into a dog. So. That's so funny. And the guy, the other Cupid going to the dating academy and spending like, th- I feel like that's a scam. He, he pays like $3,500 to go to this dating academy. I'm like, aren't you Cupid, man? Like, what's what's going on with that? Uh, so that's, it's a funny show and it is pretty like, I like the wackiness of it. So I'm looking forward to, um, but I'm going to wait until next weekend. So by next Sunday, hopefully I should have a, um, you know, I should have finished the show by then. So we'll, we'll see. But the Cupid show is pretty, it's funny. I gotta say, it's just, it's just a funny show. I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it a lot. So yeah, it's called My Man is Cupid. And the guy is like, and yeah, the guy is like literally Cupid. It's, re- it's really weird. The show is strange. All right, let's see here. Uh, Spanish soap operas run for a certain number of episodes and go on season after season. That's what I like about some of the international shows. I think a lot of these um, Western shows, it's like they try to milk every last drop of money. It's like, we got to go for 18 seasons. No, you really, like, by that time the show has jumped the shark. Nobody, you don't need 18 seasons of anything. Uh, So that's why I kind of like that everything gets wrapped up in a bow 
with one season, 12 to 16 episodes, that's really all you need. And it doesn't go on freaking forever. I just, uh, I really appreciate that. Mm. Yeah, the, the, it is fun. The My Man is Cupid one is fun. I will say Heartbeat, the first like eight episodes of Heartbeat, I really enjoyed. It's starting to like, this happens with a lot of Korean shows. So the writing and the story will be great for the first like eight episodes. And then you're like, what happened here? And then sometimes they have really like terrible endings. Which I don't really understand either because it's like, if you could make the first eight episodes awesome, why can't you make the last eight episodes equivalently good quality? I don't understand that. It's just very, I just find that very strange. So that's that's the latest with K-Drama Land. You know, this is my opportunity to talk about K-Dramas. I'm going to, I'm certainly going to take the opportunity, but I would highly recommend... Uh, those two shows. I'm trying to think what else is on Amazon Prime. Uh, Search WWW is also really good. That's on Amazon Prime. There's another show called Marriage, comma, Not Dating. That one's available with freebies. So that's like free with ads. And if you haven't heard, Amazon Prime is putting ads on everything like after this month. So I'm trying to watch all my Amazon Prime offerings ad free while I can, which kind of sucks for Amazon not happy about that. I don't want to pay the extra two ninety nine a month. Additionally, when I'm already paying for Amazon Prime, just to not watch it with ads. So, we'll see. Nancy says I've been watching NCIS for tw- twenty years. Like, what? What else can they possibly do after twenty? Like, why does a show have to be on the air that long? Like, I just don't understand. Like the the point of that. Like, ah, just end it. You know, especially when the show gets kind of old and tired. It's like, what else can you do? You know, what else can you do? So those are the K-Dramas. If you all have watched K-Dramas, let me know what you enjoy. Um, I, I definitely have my my top picks here. I tend to like the wacky shows, like the funny. Like, I don't like things that are, like, super heavy on the romance or super dark. I like dark comedy or just comedy. Um, I can deal with romantic comedy if there's a lot of comedy I don't like shows that are just pure drama. I don't know. It's just not really not really my thing. I get that there's a place for them. I just like funny shows more. <clears throat> All right, guys. I'm probably going to sign off soon. But just a quick last plug for today's live stream sponsor. Of course, the Sewing Report Etsy shop. Check out the store if you'd like to look at fabric and fun sewing supplies i also have a sale on certain fabric bundles going on right now and there is free shipping over 35 dollars so just a quick plug here but if you'd like i know a lot of you have been shopping the etsy shop and i greatly appreciate appreciate every single one of you that has placed an order but i'm jen with sewing report live thank you for joining me tonight for another good show and let me know if there are any topics you want to see me cover or stuff you want to see happen during the live stream i'm gonna i'm trying to get it together and do a live stream every sunday night we'll see we'll see if this can happen uh but i I, i've been having a lot of fun and you know we can go over new stories talk about what's going on in the sewing world let's turn on the music again while we take it out here but we've had a lot of fun tonight talking about everything from federal investigations to joanne fabrics uh, two K dramas. Yes. Hey, you got Hey, you know, you got to sponsor yourself. You know, I don't have external sponsors. You got to do what you got to do. All right. The old K dramas like Jewel in the place that over. Yeah. The 50. That's a lot. 50 episodes. I'm glad the newer ones are shorter. Yeah. I just like, I find 12 to 16 episodes to be a really good, like it's like long enough where you get to delve into the story, but not too long to where you're invest investing like years of your life. It's just, You know, it just gets old. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. Thank you, Debbie. You're one of our frequent viewers here. I'll see you guys again next week. I'm Jen with the Sewing Report live. Remember, whatever you do.